I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spin Up ahead the road is thin Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. Look through the windshield for hours at a time and odd thoughts begin to pop into your head. Why isn't there a competition, for instance, a kind of Olympics, for those who practice the trades that really make this country work? Well, there is such a competition. Come and see young bricklayers and sheet metal workers and offset printers and diesel mechanics going for the gold. Well, it's not an ulcer. It's not. Here's another odd question. Why do doctors charge so very much? Dr. Richard T. Knuckles of Lincoln, Missouri certainly doesn't know the answer. All he can tell you is that he never charges more than a dollar or two, or just a handshake, if all the patient has to give is his gratitude. I'm not in it for the money. <laughs> I tell him I expect I could have been a millionaire as long as I practiced if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. I ain't trying to be somebody good, I'm just trying to help my fellow man. Never mind the questions, here's an odd sight. Why are the fire plugs of South Bend, Indiana all gussied up? We're going to answer those questions, really we are. As soon as we get back from a visit to the Swiss family Darius. It's a tiny village high up in the clouds where the first photographs must have seemed magical. The village of Bohm is as it was, and the magical still occurs there. In this uncrowded place, the imagination of one man was directed to the making of a new art long ago. His son, and his son, and his son, and his son carried on here. Five generations of one family have been photographers in Bohm for just about as long as there has been photography. You can think about the history of photography in great museums in Paris and London and New York, but this is the best place. Photography is light and life and time passing, and all of it has happened here in this white house in this little village. It is the Darius house. It has been the family home, studio, and darkroom for all five Darius photographers. The first of them was Alphonse Darius. He left this little village to discover the world outside. The discovery that excited him most was photography. He brought it home to rural Switzerland. In his studio, he made pictures of his neighbors in frozen poses so that his primitive camera could record the images without blurring. We know precisely how the good farm wives looked. And so we know the people and the village remain unchanged. Alphonse was a photojournalist long before there was such a word. He preserved for us the style of the 19th century. For his neighbors, he recorded the rites of passage. He assembled an entire class of the local school, and in his studio in the White House, he memorialized his only son, Armand. Armand assured artistic continuity by taking over his father's studio and career. The look of Bohm and its people fascinated Armand Darius. 
His technique had a sophistication that made all his pictures more like life. The picture postcard was first produced in Switzerland by Armand Darius. He made pictures outdoors, away from the studio, to show how Baum was. It was as it still is. Armand lovingly made a picture of his son, Alphonse, playing photographer at age five. That little boy is the man on the right, the patriarch now. He lives in the house where he and the two generations before were born and where the two who followed were born. Like all of them, this Alphonse moved photography forward. In his time, Alphonse also recorded the history of his village. Modern cameras and more sensitive films freed him from the strictures of the past. His record of his time and place reveal his freedom. Darius photographers numbers three, four, and five still live and work in Baum. The postcard and publishing business is supervised by Armand II. Armand, fourth in the Darius line, has been a photojournalist through much of the world. He has covered violence in Belfast and in the Middle East. The fifth in line, Lionel, was going to be an actor. He changed his mind. He is the heir to all the talent and reputation of his family. His style is of his time. But his subjects go back to the beginnings of the family art. He photographs his neighbors. This truly is a family portrait for an exhibition of the Darius collection in Montreal. The youngest photographer under his father's expert eye is printing a picture of his great-grandfather made by his great-great-grandfather. For about as long as there has been photography, artists of five generations have shown us how it was once upon a time. Alphonse. Armand. Alphonse II. Armand II. And Lionel. The Swiss family Darius at home over much time in one place. This is a parade of Olympic champions, and there's not a shot putter or a hundred meter dash man in the crowd. You may find it a little hard to believe what all this uproar is about. It is about bricklaying and hairdressing and refrigerator repairing. Occupations, it is safe to say, most of us, even bricklayers, hairdressers, and refrigerator repairmen, find fairly unexciting. But there is no accounting for the enthusiasms of youth. These are the Skill Olympics. 1,500 youngsters, most of them high school kids from all over the country, competing for gold, silver, and bronze medallions in things like bricklaying and 29 other skills and crafts. There is Doug Birdsong from Missouri building a brick wall as if there were no tomorrow. And if you don't think the competition is tough, notice that one youngster, a state champion, has already surrendered to a bad case of nerves and has given up. These are the kids like Richard Halsell of Texas who take carpentry in school or electronics.
or diesel mechanics. There are a couple of million kids like these, most of whom will never go to college. And on the theory that it takes more than college graduates to make a country, the vocational industrial clubs of America bring the most skillful together each year to fight it out in one day under one roof. It is a sight to remember, teenaged offset printers stripping negatives at a light table, while teenage nurses' aides help patients into bed and under the scrutiny of unsmiling judges do their best to make their charges comfortable while trying to appear comfortable themselves. And in another corner, cosmetologists under the gun battling each other in the clock with curlers and hairspray. That's Lloyd Smith, 19, of Cincinnati, Ohio. He'll be Mr. Lloyd someday. That is the Pennsylvania delegation just going out of its mind. Over what? Over the news that Kenneth Fye of Pennsylvania won first place in high school machine drafting. I've been trying to think back. I guess it hasn't been since 1964 when Barry Goldwater won the Republican nomination that I've seen such enthusiasm on the floor of a convention. And what do you know? There's old Doug Birdsong from Missouri, second place in high school bricklaying. And look who's number one in cosmetology. Mr. Lloyd, 19 years old. And finally, they announced the prize for best vocational industrial club in the whole country. And when Chickasha High School from Chickasha, Oklahoma won it all, Sue Picorni just couldn't stand it. Just couldn't stand it. It was pretty clear that excellence in carpentry and auto mechanics and sheet metal working just means a lot more to these youngsters than it ever did before. That's good for them, I suppose. Good for us, too. They tell the story in South Bend of a dear, nearsighted lady who saw a child standing unattended on a downtown curb. Naturally, she rushed to prevent the kid from dashing out into the traffic and found herself reaching down to take the hand of a fire plug. Well, that was a nearsighted lady indeed. South Bend's fire hydrants are not children. They are toy soldiers, sentries in full dress heroes of the revolution. South Bend has 4,000 fire hydrants, painted by school kids and housewives and cops and cab drivers and shopkeepers on their days off. This madness all began a couple of years ago when Ruth von Karowski got tired of looking at the ugly yellow hydrant outside her house. So, with a couple of buckets of paint, she made it into a toy soldier. The reaction, she says, was, well, immediate. We had the fire chief, as I remember, and we had all kinds of city officials, the waterworks, and they were all here in their official cars with all the badges shining in the sun and all stomping around this little hydrant. Some of them were angry, some of them were curious, but I think there must be a little bit of toy soldier in every grown-up man because some of them, the angriest ones, after they'd really looked at it, would say things like, oh, isn't that cute? The city officials approved, and civic pride took it from there. Mrs. von Karowski has copyrighted her designs and is now busy showing other cities how to end the blight of the plain plug. She dreams of regiments of little minute men on street corners from sea to shining sea. Well, it's true that uniformed fire plugs do something for your spirits, a while back, on a visit to Williamsburg, Virginia, we recorded, just for the fun of it, the sound of the daily muster on the parade ground. And walking through South Bend, the tune of the fifes and drums came back to us. say they're just fire plugs if you like, but South Bend doesn't feel that way.
It's not quite sunup yet in Lincoln, Missouri, but there's already a light in the window of Calamity Jane's Antique Shop, and the old store is full of people. They come early and take a number and take a seat. They're all waiting to see the doctor. To keep his expenses down, Dr. Richard T. Knuckles rents a little room in the back of Calamity Jane's. Well, it's not an ulcer. It's not. And here in these plain surroundings, he treats his neighbor's ailments. And here he collects his fees. Okie doke. Three dollars all told. Three dollars all told. Dr. Knuckles is not a high-priced doctor. How much? One dollar. Plenty. Thank you. Okay, dollar. Dr. Knuckles charges you only for the medicine he dispenses. If he figures you can't afford it, then he doesn't charge you anything. Sometimes we give him a tip. We get big heart and give him a tip. <laughs> Buy a cup of coffee. Feel ashamed. Yeah, yeah, this kind of feel ashamed. Yeah. That's the prime cause for business. The doctor's fee is a dollar or two, or three at the most. We're used to doctors on their way to becoming millionaires. I told Dr. Knuckles that I hardly knew what to make of him. I'm not in it for the money. <laughs> I tell him I expect I could have been a millionaire as long as I practiced if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. I ain't trying to be somebody good. I'm just trying to help my fellow man. Much of his small income doesn't even go into the bank. It goes into the ice box. He is I paid in buttermilk right. and butter. Oh, my gracious. Look at that. Yeah. Boy, that looks good. What is it? Well, it's apple strudel apple without strudel. any sugar in it. Oh. He is paid in apple strudel and in the deep affection of people he has known and Thank tended to so all his life. I'll work on that. <laughs> I'll bring you some more next time. Thank you. Do, you. do you get a lot of produce? A lot of produce. I get everything. Fish. Fish, rabbit, quail, duck, wild turkey, coons. Gooseberries, blackberries, pecans, chicken, <laughs> all of it, and I love it. It's better for what you buy. I'd rather have the money. <laughs> Richard T. Knuckles follows in the tradition of his father, who was a country doctor, and his grandfather, who was a country doctor. We are all of us grateful for modern medicine and grateful for modern doctors. We're less haunted by illness because of them. But still, we feel the loss of men like Richard Knuckles. Back when America was a baby, bouncing west in the lap of history, it was doctors like Doc Knuckles who saw us through our fevers and set our broken bones and held our hands. They got in payment only what we could give, and they always gave more than they got. It's still that way in Lincoln, Missouri. I may not get all of it picked up, but I'll pick up part of it. Now, that's the time. Few of them loose in there. <laughs> Complicated cases he may send to the hospital in Sedalia, but if you don't really need an operation, this doctor never recommends one. He's just got some enlarged tonsils, and as he gets older, he won't have near as much trouble with him anyway, and I sure wouldn't take him out. He needs it. I think he For this advice, since it was to do nothing, he charged nothing. When the waiting room is finally empty, Dr. Knuckles makes house calls. They're free, too. He's been doing this for 48 years, doctoring anybody who comes to him for a dollar or two, or a mason jar of buttermilk, or a handshake of thanks. You'd think he'd be ready to hang up his black bag and sit in the sun somewhere, but he'll never do that. I don't know how to retire. I, I'm not a setter. I just can't sit around and do nothing. And I tell people that getting in a rocking chair is the worst thing they can do when they retire. And I even mentioned quitting out here. They just come to tears, and, and I don't know what they'll do when I do quit. It's going to be an awful jolt, the way some of these doctors are charging. How many people are there who think all the time about the needs of others, and about their own needs, not at all? Well, here is one. Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way.
I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years I've been a wonder Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around 